Thank you everyone for coming. I wanted to welcome Councillor Keating. Thank you for being here today. Today I'll be talking about the Green Line and the trip that we took from Calgary to Seattle, Vancouver and Portland. We haven't started consulting yet, so I wanted to share some ideas on, on our trip. And rather than focus on the technical details, I'll take a community view. I'll give you uh, some ideas to think about and inspire some thoughtful engagement with the communities. How will this fit into your neighborhood? What are the pitfalls to avoid? How can you benefit? If you're with the City of Calgary, how can you participate and make this project even better? I wanted to introduce Jonathan Lee. He'll be talking about where we are in the process. Jonathan? If I go back to the 1970s, I have drawings on my desk where we had a, uh, it was called the North LRT at that point, went through uh, downtown and up through uh, the east side of Center Street, uh, Bridge or Crescent Heights and Renfrew, up Center Street, and then through what is now the Highland Park Golf Course, or what was until recently the Highland Park Golf Course. So we have really old drawings. Uh, that uh, show where we should have rapid transit for Calgary. So this is an idea that goes back a few years, but we've been updating it in the past few years to be in line with our new municipal development plan and Calgary transportation plan. So in uh, earlier this year, after two or three years of work uh, with the communities, we have a new alignment that was approved by council on Center Street and Harvest Hills Boulevard. And again, that more aligns with putting transit where the people are, uh, rather than making people go to Nose Creek Valley on buses which was the old council approved alignment. So the green line itself is a 40 kilometer LRT. We've got uh, from North Point in the north of the city to Seton in the southeast, and we're looking at it as an urban spine. It's not just an LRT project, it's not just building LRT through the city, but it's what can we leverage from this project to make Calgary a better place for us to live, for, uh, and redevelopment opportunities we're looking at. How do we integrate other projects like affordable housing? Uh, and even some lessons learned that Councillor Farrell talked about, even smaller projects that communities are working on. How do we leverage those as part of the bigger project? So it's a, we go through five wards in the north, uh, or five wards, sorry, 16 communities. And it's one of the biggest public works, well, the big, biggest public works project that Calgary has ever undertaken. So the part that we're looking at first is how do we connect the southeast and the north line? We have a couple of fixed points. The green line southeast was just recently approved, the stations and the route alignment. So that's what you've seen in the media recently. Uh, now we're starting on the north and the downtown. So the fixed part on the north side of the river is Center Street. But how do we get uh, through downtown? How do we connect communities in downtown? And how do we do that in a thoughtful way? That's what we're working on right now as well as the rest of the alignment all the way up to the future community of Keystone, 160th Ave North. We do have that many avenues in the north. That's uh, north of Stony Trail. So we're looking at five options. What we're calling option A is primarily at grade or street level. That's using the ex existing Center Street Bridge. Uh, so putting rails back on the bridge, which we had until about the 1950s when we had the old streetcars going up and down Center Street. Uh, then turns west on 3rd Ave and then dives into a tunnel. In each of these options, we want to grade separate, uh, either have the LRT above or below the east-west avenues, 7th Avenue where the existing LRT is, uh, the future 8th Avenue subway tunnel, and the CPR tracks. Uh, and you can see these also, there's some boards outside that uh, have these images on them. So you can get really up close and personal. So here's an image of what it could look like on Center Street with the LRT running in the middle and a traffic lane on each side of the LRT. So really changing the character of Center Street from a motorway to an urban boulevard and a transit-oriented street. Option B involves a new bridge. So we go uh, under 16th Ave, we stay underground through the Crescent Heights portion of Center Street, and then we come out of, uh, west of Center Street over the Bow River, over Prince's Island Park, landing in Eau Claire with a station in Eau Claire, and then again under CPR tracks, 7th Ave, 8th Ave, and the East-West Avenues. So that's just uh, focusing in on Princes Island and a, a conceptual route of where that bridge would be over the east end of Princes Island. 
Option C is similar to the last one, north of the river. So we have, a, again, a tunnel uh, under Center Street in Crescent Heights. We have a new bridge over the Bow River and Prince's Island. And then in this option, we stay elevated through downtown. So we're going, in each of these instances, I should say, we're going along 2nd Street southwest. Uh, this one, we'll, we're elevated along 2nd Street over all the avenues, over the CPR tracks, and then connecting to the southeast. So it'll be similar height to what we have in Sonalta. So we've got a, a local precedent that we can see just uh, on our front door. Option D is a four kilometer tunnel from the north side of uh, 16th Ave, so where Crescent Heights and Tuxedo Park communities are. Uh, fully tunneled under 16th Ave, under Crescent Heights, under the Bow River, under Princes Island, under 2nd Street Southwest, and connecting to 10th Avenue South. And there's an image of what Center Street would look like with a tunnel underneath. And Councillor Farrell has some great uh, images of some tunneled stations that we saw on our trip. So there is another option we don't have here, but it's really a hybrid of option A and B, A and B. And uh, it, we have an image of that outside. So it's another option that we're looking at where you come down Center Street at grade and then swing to the west on a new bridge again and over Prince's Island. So we're looking at, at five different options right now and our public engagement will focus on the criteria that we're using uh, to select that preferred alignment. So a couple of key decision dates there. Public engagement we're starting up now and will be in full force in January and hope to see all of your lovely faces at our events as we move forward. I think we'll, there you go, thank you. So our trip was, um, as I mentioned, to three cities. We were joined by Councillor Keating and Stevenson and representatives from the Transit, Calgary Transit, Transportation and the Planning Department. The host cities were extremely generous in, with their time. They, they lent us their top people for the entire day and they spent the whole day with us telling us um, wh what to look out for and our opportunities. So I will go over the key lessons from each city and other than the flight to Vancouver, we traveled by rail exclusively. There are many lessons from the trip and I foc I'll focus on eight of the key lessons, starting with consultation. Each city stressed the need for meaningful consultation. Vancouver's TriMet stressed that it was one of their key pieces of advice. And if they had consulted better, they could have avoided major disruption. They also stressed that after full and meaningful consultation to stick to the plan to avoid expensive change orders. Leverage. There's many examples of how to leverage a major rail project, especially in Portland. And this isn't just a train project. This project will transform our city and our neighborhoods for the rest of um, our history. And how can we make the most of it? How can we solve problems and seize opportunities? I'll show many examples of making the most of the train in my presentation. Taking care of business, I'll talk about how business can survive and thrive during and after construction. Plan for growth. This is a photo from Vancouver. They didn't plan for growth. Build to last. This image is from Seattle. Default to at grade. So the low floor system is a new system for Calgary, but it's well used in many <coughs> other cities around the world, and it has many advantages. And it's now the technology of choice. So a system that works well in winter climates. And so the recommendation for me is to default to at grade wherever possible. And I'll show you a low floor train system that can integrate beautifully into the street and become a real neighborhood asset. The images will speak for themselves. We didn't see any examples of elevated rail in an urban area that in my view worked for the street level, even though we looked. Deep stations can work. I think we were all surprised by what we saw in, in Seattle, and this lesson relates directly to the community of Crescent Heights. I'll start with Vancouver. Vancouver is a very different system than what we're contemplating. They have a driverless system, and that technology drives many of the decisions for them and that don't apply to the Calgary context. And as a result, it's very important for them to separate the user from the conflicts. 
So it was underground in the city of Vancouver and elevated outside the city of Vancouver. Their system was built for the Olympics. It was built in a rush and it was at capacity almost from the beginning. So they didn't plan for growth. The focus was on keeping costs low and it showed and they didn't build it to last. The quality of the stations weren't included in their specs. If we're contemplating a P3 private public partnership, um, we need to really include that in our specs. Um, underfunded life cycle maintenance. They had a really interesting governance model. TransLink considered themselves separate to the, to the municipality, partly because they were traveling through a number of municipalities. But they saw their job as solely to deliver a rail project and transit oriented development, nothing more. So really not integrated in other city city interests. They had an interesting approach though to the idea of innovation and they rewarded innovation in their, in their company and in their operations and I think Calgary could learn from that example of how do you reward innovation and encourage innovation from your staff. Outside the city of Vancouver the system was elevated and I'll show a series of slides that demonstrate the impact on the street. Here's an example of an elevated station. It's a very wide carriageway and to the, the members of the public, that means the width of the road from curb to curb. It's similar in context to Sun Alta, and I believe that we did a much better job in Calgary, in Sun Alta Station. Here's an example of an elevated station from the platform. It's already starting to show signs of wear, and that's the risk of P3 system. You need to forecast and imagine the problems that you would be forced, uh, you may be um, um, confronted with, and build them into the performance contract. The street experience was brutal. Note the street from curb to curb is much wider than the condition that we have in Calgary. So there were no examples that I saw in Vancouver that we would want to see us emulate. Picture this in Chinatown, Earl Clare. In the Calgary context, the width of the elevated rail would go almost from curb to curb. So if you're contemplating this in Chinatown, for example, it would almost extend from curb to curb. Um, during the Lost Spaces competition, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, it's initiated by detox, which means design talks. A number of the groups chose underneath the Sonalta station as an area that needed to be fixed. It was considered a lost space. And there were some really interesting ideas that came out of that exercise. Um, but it's not really all about light, it's about maneuverability and connections. And while Sonalta has decent light, it's still considered a lost space. So my question is, Calgary already has so many lost spaces that need fixing, why would we want to create more? Elevated rail requires up ramps at some point, and it's not kind to the street experience. So again, imagine this in Chinatown or Eau Claire. This image is as close as it appears. So Vancouver had a sophisticated approach to transit-oriented development. They integrated the land use and transportation, and when they mean integrated, they meant it. Uh, it was almost zero setback from the rail, or they even uh, built over the rail. The train, however, was very noisy. There was a lot of screeching as they went around corners, and I would be concerned about that noise level from the elevated rail, as well as privacy issues. Vancouver actively marketed transit-oriented development land. It was integrated into, their, into TransLink. And their key piece of advice, and I thought this was a really interesting piece of advice, it was very similar to what we did in East Village, which was know your market. What would convince someone to buy in a rail development and then create those conditions? There were real estate experts that were part of the team and they continued as part of the team, not just at the beginning. They focused on leveraging for community benefits and amenities. There was an expectation that the developers would contribute, contribute to those amenities. And again, it was part of the whole concept of know your market. Why would someone want to live here? And then they would incorporate those amenities into the development. And this is a community garden. So it wasn't just expensive stuff and public realm stuff. It was also community building activities. There was an expectation of high environmental standards. And I think that means more today, especially this week, than ever before. 
They incorporated district energy and there was lots of opportunity to leverage with city owned NMAX and that's one of the reasons I invited NMAX to this meeting is we have an opportunity to incorporate district energy in areas of, of uh, extra density as well as beyond district energy. Um, they incorporated public art even in the district energy stacks. In this example, the lights glow blue during low demand and red during high demand. This is very cool. Right now we're having a debate on whether we should incorporate park and rides along the Green Line. Vancouver stressed, and they stressed, that land near transit was so valuable that parking was allowed only at the terminus stations. They charge for parking in some of the stations, and they're considering charging for parking at all of their stations. This is a parking structure connected to the train stop. And I, I, to note, Seattle is also going through the same exercise of whether or not to charge for parking at all their park and ride stations. TransLink stressed, and then stressed again, that they, if they were to do it all over again, they would emphasize better consultation. We heard from all three cities that consultation prior to making decisions is essential, as well as communication during construction. And then stick to the plan, stick to the development plan to avoid costly change orders during construction. They're in the midst of a class action lawsuit from the businesses along Camby Street. And they thought that if they would have consulted better, that um, likely expensive class action lawsuit could have been avoided. <coughs> now on to Seattle. So Seattle has a system very similar to what we're contemplating in Calgary. And, and, and it opens up huge opportunities for Calgary to build our first truly neighborhood integrated rail. It's very different from the race platforms that we see in Calgary. And I think we need, to, um, we need to exercise ourselves from the impact that these raised platforms have on the street and start thinking about how the rail can integrate in with a neighborhood. The Seattle's governance is very similar to Vancouver. They had a separate transit company and they again saw themselves as separate from the municipality. So they saw their job as delivering rail. I think they left a number of opportunities on the table and there were certainly silos we didn't see any people from the municipality of Seattle in, in our tour. Built to last. They had a very high quality infrastructure and they built it to last. It was well funded through a percentage of their sales tax and that was determined through a plebiscite. Their attention to detail, they use this term, delight the user. They were proud of that term and, and details matter. That was an, uh, another part of their policy. I, I was blown away by their boldness in using delight the user as one of their principles for transit. And they're obviously having a lot of fun. Gorgeous, high quality materials, the use of granite throughout, common elements throughout the entire system. In my opinion, I thought the stations were a bit overbuilt. I'm not sure if the cost outweighed the benefit, but I think the future will tell, and this is certainly future proof. The Beacon Hill station surprised all of us. The underground stations were very deep. There's a very small footprint at the end of the day after construction at the surface, which al would allow for redevelopment, high quality, durable materials transformed by public art. The deep stations served by a bank of high-speed elevators. There were no escalators at this station. It helped to keep the footpr footprint small at the surface, and they're selling off land currently for transit-oriented development. A sense of expansion and a deep sky of type of experience. And that's how the artist Dan Corson described the effect. The artists are included in the design team at all their stations. And it's obvious that they have a tremendous influence. This was one of the nicest, if not the nicest, underground station I've seen anywhere. It was modest. It wasn't extravagant. It was just well designed with quality materials. High quality and durable materials, often with public art embedded in the elements. The art was everywhere. Calgary could learn from the Seattle's approach to public art. It was used to enhance the space, and it wasn't just added later. Seattle had a 1% public art policy since 1973, and they're extremely proud of it. They don't debate it anymore. So this is moving on to the on-street train. Notice that the trains are in the center, 
and they have long covered platforms. Also notice that the platforms aren't much higher than a regular curb. And it's one of the beauties of a low floor system and certainly a lot less expensive than what we have today. A street in this location is about as wide as the north part of Centre Street, north of Ignite, McKnight Boulevard. Notice anything missing? There are no gates. So busy with pedestrians, cars, buses, bikes, and everyone felt safe and it was completely wheelchair accessible. I'll talk more about that later. The trains traveled through neighborhoods. This reminded me of the residential portion of Center Street. I've got three slides. Here's the second one, very reminiscent of Center Street. And this shows that a low floor system can fit in nicely with a quiet residential street. It wasn't just their train system, but most of the public realm in Seattle was barrier free. Accessibility features were high quality, seamless and consistent. Incorporated urban braille, which is the textured sidewalks and clear uh, right of way. Um, these textured sidewalks, I'm calling them bubbles, but they're actually called truncated domes. Um, they're actual braille in the stations and in the elevators. So social justice was a stated priority and it really showed. In some of the suburban communities, they chose elevated rail. Underneath was done much better than in Vancouver, and this is an example of the Mount Baker station. This is an example of the platform. And again, the development was integrated with the station very close, the land use, the development was very close to the actual rail, but it, I believe it was designed better. It didn't feel like you were imposing on the neighbors like you did in Vancouver. The underneath was done much better. It was well lit and incorporated public art and art that was lighting. And we thought it could even be better if they incorporated retail. It was a decent attempt to humanize, but note again that the right of way, um, there, there's no road underneath it. So very different than what we would be contemplating in the downtown core. Here's another example of an elevated station. This is the Tequila station. Both Tequila and Mount Baker had wide carriageways, again. Um, there, it was almost like a park-like setting, allowing for sunlight to penetrate to the ground level. So there was no example of elevated station in a narrow carriageway or with a road underneath it. Certainly not one that I was aware of anyway. There was a decent attempt to brighten with glazing and bright yellow color. And again, no buildings were adjacent to create a tunnel effect. Even well designed, it was a difficult pedestrian environment. Again, built to last. It was a beautiful station, incorporated and peppered with public art throughout. I've had a number of people bring up the idea of a monorail and Seattle's monorail for um, an idea for Calgary, so I thought I would touch on it. The monorail in Seattle has very low ridership. It's slow and it's used predominantly as a tourist destination. I don't see it and I don't believe we're contemplating it as a solution for Calgary. There's some interesting attempts to integrate with the adjacent buildings, so I thought I would show those. This is the Frank Gehry Experience Music Project, an absolutely stunning building. And it shows how the train can in be incorporated into the design of the building, which could apply in the Calgary context, perhaps in, uh, in Eau Claire Market. I just had to show two pictures because this building is so cool. And it had really, beside it, it has the best playground I have ever seen in my life. And I felt like I was nine years old again. So did Jonathan. We had a hard time leaving. <laughs> it was absolutely stunning. The system incorporated other modes of transportation, and we saw that throughout. They incorporated bike share and bike lockups and repair stations. And they, these were accessed with their transit card, the electronic transit card. And it was another example of le uh, leveraging opportunities. Wayfinding was also obvious to the train user. And there's nice touches like connecting to the, uh, the distance to key connections. They integrated other modes in their way wayfinding. They show where to find the bike storage and the bike routes. And they showed bus connections. 
The bus connections were highly visible right in the front of the rail station in almost every example that I noticed. And it showed how the train is incorporated with other modes. The connections were prominent and highly visible. And we fell in love with their public art. It was bold and bright and fun. And it showed up absolutely everywhere. I guess if you've been doing it since 1973, you find every opportunity to incorporate it. This is a storage yard. It was highly visible from the train. It was playful and colorful and inexpensive. And again, it was to delight the user. And the art showed up in the most unexpected places. Those are uh, guide wire supports. I'll go back. Most of the guide wire supports had some sort of sculpture on top. This was my hands down favorite. It was useful public art. It was incorporating storm water made of granite. And they were proud of their art. The interpretive signage was visible and the art was explained. All of the cities that we visited had very visible transit ambassadors. That's Rita <laughs> getting her card checked. I'm not sure if it was for our benefit or if, um, if they had that many visible transit uh, ambassadors for safety. So on to Portland. Portland has a very similar context to Calgary. Their LRT travels from the airport and it works well in a high-speed elevated freeway environment and a suburban context. And it shows that a single line and a single train type can achieve multiple goals as with the low floor trains. It worked beautifully in an urban context. So it can be a suburban rail and an urban catalyst. In Calgary, the train will travel through very different neighborhoods. And it's important we recognize the, and plan for those differences. And we have some excellent examples to draw from. Of the three cities I got the most from the Portland visit, the word to best describe the Portland approach was respect. They talked about governing values, collaborative, integrated approach, green is good, and they were only group that brought tran uh, tr the planners, the actual development planners from the municipality, as well as their lead architect, and it was obvious that they worked as a team. Portland was open to opportunities and asked the question, how can we make this project be a catalyst for other projects in the city? I'll leave this slide up for a minute. This shows that it's not just a train. And this is how in-depth they went into their station planning. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. The process reminded me very much of the Boda Bluff process that we went through with Sunnyside. They worked with local community groups and businesses and seized every opportunity to enhance and improve. And that interest brought, and that attitude brought in private interests and private investment and people wanted to be a part of it. How can they leverage this project to create something bigger and better? There was an unlimited scope for ideas. It reminded me of the Boda Bluff project where all stakeholders found a way to leverage. I'll introduce the concept of equitable transit-oriented development. If federal monies were available, it must benefit all. And I'll talk more on that later. They had their own legal counsel to sort out legal and jurisdictional issues and there was a true commitment to innovation. I love this slide. It talks about their decision-making process, and it was guided by a quote by Alan Jacobs, the author of Great Streets. We can design our streets, we can design our city by the way we design our streets. This slide reveals activities and qualities that distinguish the city and it accommodates all modes without compromise. So establish and maintain a physical quality that inspires all who use it. And interested to know that the re residents of Crescent Heights, the community of Crescent Heights, is going through a similar exercise on their own. So we'll be able to incorporate their work into our work. Center Street used to be a great street, and it can again. And we have some great examples to learn from. And this slide is a bit hard to read, but it talks about the need for a great streetscape. And we can learn a lot from this slide. We have a tendency to jumble it all together uh, and, and all of our street furniture together, and it's brutal for urban braille and maneuverability. So they recognize the importance of zones, pedestrian through zones, and separating that from the street furniture. 
Portland had a dedicated busway since 1978, so it was very easy for them to convert to train. They started, interestingly, they, they started with the same raised floor platform system that we have in Calgary today, but they made a decision to convert recently to low floor trains. As with their busway, Portland chose a curb alignment for their stops in most locations. While they had elevated in some suburban locations, their first choice was at grade in their urban areas. And it integrated beautifully, again, with street life and the neighborhood. TriMet, the company charged with, with uh, transit, recommended fewer stops to maintain speed of service. And as we saw in Seattle, it was barrier free. Dogs and cats living together. In their core, Portland used pairs of parallel one-way streets or one-way couplets. Their trains have fewer cars than in Calgary. They have shorter blocks than we do in Calgary. And, but they have bus and car and in some streets bikes and pedestrians and trains all living together. We asked if chaos ensued and uh, no, it, it works just fine. This picture might be a bit blurry but it shows, shows the blue line intersecting with the red line. The trains sometimes travel down very narrow streets, one-way streets. It shows the beauty and flexibility of the low-floor train, and it can function almost like a streetcar. One of Portland's stated goals is to create urban rooms, trains knit comfortably into the street environment. And the train, in my view, had less of an impact than a regular city bus. It was quieter and there was no lovely burst of diesel when the train or when the bus left the curb. So one thing that they advise us is don't underfund maintenance. That was something they felt that they did was underfund maintenance. They're going into and having to repair later. As with Seattle, social justice was a stated priority and it showed in everything that they do. Notice honored citizens rather than low income transit pass. I think that says it all. Accommodate all modes without compromise. That's a stated goal. Imagine. Their branding incorporated all modes of transportation. By train, by tram, by bike, by streetcar, by foot. The stations were high quality, but not wasteful. No granite on the platform, just high quality concrete. They had smaller shelters than in Seattle, but they used a principle of design and architecture that with a limited budget, you focus on a few noticeable elements. So there was lots of public art. They have a 1% public art policy since 1985, and they've increased it to 2% just recently. I thought the implementation was more subtle than in Seattle, and perhaps not as successful, but these were lovely, these were mosaic at the stations, and the art in the strangest places. Whenever possible, they looked at ways to leverage and incorporate adaptive reuse and heritage reuse. And here's an old transit stop that they turned into a coffee shop. Now note, this was the city that turned the old transit stop into a coffee shop. I'm going to introduce a principle and a perfect example of leveraging is a concept that's becoming prevalent in the US. It's equity through transit-oriented development, or ETOD. I think it has important principles that Calgary could benefit from. It was commitment along with federal dollars. They would expect that, um, that you would have equity in your transit-oriented development. So this could help build a case with our provincial and federal partners. TOD that is amenity rich incorporating affordable housing, critical services, mobility options, reduce cost of living, bolster local economies, higher environmental standards, and health through active lifestyles. So the Hasselow Eco District is a great example of equitable transit oriented development. It's really the best example of transit oriented development I have ever seen. Hasselo, and here's a list of their stated objectives. Habitat, energy, waste, health, social equity, beauty. The photo shows black water treatment system. 
It includes a constructed wetland. It treats all gray water using, using natural methods on site. Now note, this is in an urban area. <coughs> and it was beautiful. We saw it while it was under construction. Here's a rendering of the community when it's completed. They've included 1,200 bike parking stalls and reuse of old buildings. It was really stunning. And they were so proud of it. Affordable housing was stressed by all three cities we visited and was considered a key principle for equitable transit-oriented development. High quality design for their affordable housing. I think we have a lot of opportunities and a social responsibility to incorporate that in the city's context. Accessibility was high quality and consistent. Again, liberal use of sidewalk bubbles. That's my new term. Transit offered travel training for people with mobility or cognitive issues. Travel training. They would even take people on trips to help them understand the system. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. This rendering shows a wide bridge that incorporates, oh, I skipped one. This is the Tillicum Crossing. The Portlandians are very proud of this bridge. I don't think it's as handsome as our little red bridge, but it's very nice. Um, they call it the Bridge of the People. They have t-shirts with this bridge. And the, this rendering is, shows a wide bridge that accommodates trains, buses, pedestrians, and bikes. It's really well used. But the landing, in my view, was less successful. Portland stands over water and lands in an unbuilt area. In Calgary, it would stand over and shadow Princes Island and land in Eau Claire. Here's another example of an up, um, ramp, up ramp. It's better than Vancouver, but still could be improved upon. There was still an impact to the street vibrancy. The, uh, it's, it's a very new area, so the vegetation was new, and I'm sure it will improve over time. There's a lot happening in this picture. The stormwater management is expected at all their stations. These are examples of rain gardens. They accommodate all modes. Here we have bike lanes, and there's a commitment to green infrastructure. I was uh, gratified to note that we'll be looking at solar at all our stations, as well as wind en energy for the entire system. Wind and solar. I want to talk a little bit about taking care of business during construction. Here's some principles from Portland. Can contrast to the Vancouver example, where they're still embroiled in a class action lawsuit years after launching of their Canada line. So the Portland train travels through a number of poorer neighborhoods with e ethnic diversity. So they worked with each community to leverage opportunities. My notice of motion to develop a business support pro program prior to construction of the Green Line was passed unanimously by council. Consultation was emphasized. How to support local business during construction and afterwards. They had a small business program to strengthen viability. They ensured access. They had a great example of a print shop. There was a print shop that was in the middle of the construction zone. And so TriLink used that print shop to have all their printing done. And their business actually went up during period of construction. They encouraged the work crews to patronize local employ uh, local residents or local restaurants, I'm sorry, and they represented the neighborhood in employment, so they bought local. There was a low interest loan program, business oriented workshops, promotions, marketing and retail consultant, HR consulting, and this is a really good lesson for Calgary. They worked with the local businesses to show what change looks like. How can you benefit from this construction? So they showed the before example, from this to this. From this to this. The businesses knew what to expect and they wanted to be a part of it. So to recap, there were many community <coughs> lessons that I learned from this trip. And I've highlighted eight throughout this presentation. And if you take away two of the most important ones, it's the importance of consultation, which feeds into the importance to leverage. We have opportunity to leverage this project. The Green Line will be one of the most important projects 
in Calgary's history. It will forever define the neighborhoods around it. So how can we work together to get the most of the green line to help our communities and neighborhoods thrive? I just uh, had to throw this one out as inspiration. Uh, my friend Sherry emailed this to me last night. This is in Montpellier, France, and the trains are designed by Christine Lacroix, if anyone is interested in fashion as I am. It's one of the France's top designers. Um, so they don't think small. And look at how it integrates the street. So thanks goes to the host cities and the city's transportation department, and especially to Rita and Andrew for babysitting the councillors during the trip. I wanted to thank you for your time. I, I don't think we have time for any questions. Do we have it? What's the time, you guys? So I think everybody came for their lunch hour. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, if, if we take anything away from my presentation, you may agree with it, you may disagree with it, is that this isn't just a train project. We think big. Let's make the most of this most expensive investment in Calgary's history. And uh, let's get to work. Thank you.